If you're into interesting interviews with nature and wildlife photographers, this is the place. Twice a month on the 15th and 30th, we bring you in-depth interviews with photographers taking interesting approaches to their craft. And now, on to the show. If you want to learn about polar bears and polar bear photography, you're in the right place. Welcome back. I'm your host, Kirby Flanagan, and I'm a nature and wildlife photographer. With me today is expert wildlife photographer, Daniel J. Cox. Dan has photographed wildlife on all seven continents, but his special interest is the Arctic and its most famous inhabitants, polar bears. Be sure to stick around to see some of Dan's wonderful polar bear photos. Welcome, Dan. Thank you, Kirby. Good to be here. So for those of you, or for those who don't know you and and your work, tell everybody about your photographer self. Well, um, yeah, it's, uh, I've been, I've been doing this a long time. I started out as a, as a young kid, uh, like a lot of us do, and kind of around 16 years old, got started in the world of photography. My dad enjoyed photography, Um, had a young man come stay with us from Japan, my 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 six my uh, during the time I was in high school when I was 16 years old, and um, Dad had a camera that he allowed me to use around the farm that I grew up on, but he wouldn't let me take it to school. So he said, "If you want to take it to school, you got to buy your own." So uh, my sister and I <laughs> sold an old car that we had split together. I got my 500 bucks and I I gave it to this young man Takashi Koyama. He went to Japan and he bought me my first camera. So, um, so it was from there on out, I, you know, I just had a a passion and a love for photography. I grew up hunting and fishing as a kid. My father was an avid, uh, hunter and gatherer, I call him and, uh, lots of cousins and, and family members in my family that, uh, love to hunt and fish. And that's how I got interested in wildlife and nature, but the photography passion just kind of started by itself on its own to begin with. But then I had this desire to be in the outdoors as much as possible and I kind of just kind of kind of connected the dots so uh yeah so going through high school then went to college uh, worked for a newspaper in college and a commercial studio Grand Mason Studios in Duluth Minnesota and doing lots of weddings and pizzas and caskets and all kinds of things and um and then put myself through college taking pictures uh doing mainly weddings uh, along with the commercial work that I did for the studio and uh, about 21 years old, I was crazy enough to decide to try and do this full time. Uh, and I couldn't have done it without what was at the time I called my bread and butter subject, which were white tailed deer. And so I would spend the falls photographing white tails, go to New York in January or February and uh, sell my sell my wares in New York City for about a week and then go down to Washington, D.C. and spend time there and and I'd make enough money for the rest of the year. And I didn't, but I, I didn't live real well, but I, I, I was, I was able to get by. So that's kind of how it all got started. Uh, and the rest is history, I guess, there, as they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it was, it was a challenge. You know, that was in the eighties, uh, early eighties. I was going to New York and DC in the early eighties. Something that, you know, was kind of neat. I met a, I met a gentleman uh, in an organization I was, I was I attended a I attended a a presentation or through the Professional Photographers of America in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. I went there. My boss sent me there to learn about weddings and you know take wedding seminars and so forth. And um, there was one there on outdoor photography by a, a guy named Pete Zura C C Z U R A. I've tried to track down his work in the in the in the last few years and I. I can't find a lot about him, but he did a lot of work for Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, Sports of Field. And um, we were, I, so I saw his program and I, I actually skipped my one of my wedding programs to go see this. And uh, it was so exciting to see a guy that was doing what I had hoped I was going to be able to do. So after the presentation, I asked him, I, I asked him if I could take him, uh, if I could buy him a drink. And at the time I was 21 years old. And we're walking down the hallway of the Holiday Inn in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. And he looks at me and says, are you old enough to drink? <laughs> I said, "I said, yeah, I am actually. But it was a great time to sit down with a, a gentleman who told me at the time, he said, you know, 
if you really want to make it and you really want to do this, you have to get to New York City and meet the editors that you're going to be dealing with. And um, so that next year, it gave me about myself about a year to get a portfolio put together. And I started making calls and I went to New York City and spent a week, uh, saw 17 different people in, in my first week in New York City. But I credit Pete Zura to giving me the confidence. And, you know, as he told me then, he says, you know, it's kind of scary, but they're all just like us. They put their pants on every morning, one leg at a time, and uh, just go in and, and see them and talk to them. And, and that's how it kind of all got going. And, and it worked very well. I did that for about 10 years. Well, uh, as I mentioned in your intro, you photographed uh, wildlife on all seven continents. But uh, these days, you're mostly interested in polar bears. So, uh, what brought that about? Uh, that's not the easiest subject to photograph, that's for sure. Yeah, you're right. Um, it was a little crazy. I gr- I've always grown up on the northern part of the United States. I lived in, born in Spokane, Washington, moved from there to uh, my family moved to northern Minnesota. So we lived up in northern Minnesota. And then when I wanted to get back out west, I moved here to Montana. So I've always had this affi- uh, uh, affinity for living on the edge of, of the northern parts of the United States. Um was was introduced very early on as a young boy living on a hobby farm my father's hobby farm in northern minnesota ran into black bears and had a chance to photograph black bears and that got me really excited about you know all kinds of bear you know thinking about bears in general not living too far south of churchill manitoba um it, you know that's kind of where that's where the most accessible polar bears are in the world for people to go to see and so as a kid, uh, earning my living in my 20s, thinking I needed to try and get polar bears, that was the first idea that I thought about. And, and, and at that time, that was in the 19, you know, like 85 range. I'd seen so many pictures from Ch- Churchill that I thought, you know, they're, they're really, I got to find somewhere else. So I did some more research. And there's a, there was a place that you can no longer go to, but it was north of Churchill, uh, several hundred miles uh, that that had typically in the summertime um, ice that lasted longer than the main ice on on the Hud- on Hudson Bay. It's a finger of Hudson Bay, and um, the bears would kind of kind kind of congregate there. Long story short, I went there for ten days. Out of ten days, I got uh, one roll of film. Now, for those of you that don't know <laughs> what film is, I suppose most of us are that are listening to this are the you know older generation. I don't know. I hope we can attract some young people. But but you know, one roll of thirty six exposure film I got on that whole trip, and even though I brought you know maybe fifty or sixty rolls, but so we didn't. We saw one polar bear, and um, I came away from that you know as a young man trying to make a living and thinking, wow. I've spent a lot of money. That trip was about seven thousand dollars in nineteen eighty-five. That's a. It's still a lot of dough, but it was really a lot of dough there. And um, so I decided, you know, maybe I better try Churchill. And so I went to Churchill, and I've been going back almost every year since. Um, and it's and it's because it is the you know the the Churchill population of polar bears are those are the most southern polar bears in the U, in the world. Uh, so they're, they're, and they're, and they're in a place that is relatively accessible. You have to fly into, you either have to fly or take a train to Churchill, but it is relatively accessible by the Arctic standards. And, and the Arctic is a very expensive place to get to. So, so as a young man trying to figure out how I was going to make pictures that would help me make a living, I said, well, there's polar bears there. And it's less expensive to get to than lots of places in the Arctic. I think I'll try it. So that's how that all started. Um, we, you and I are one of the things that uh, we kind of messaged each other about is my, is my work with the Arctic documentary project. And basically that came around uh, by way of my connection with polar bears international. So, um, so that's what we're, that's what we're doing right now. And uh uh, you know, lots of things going on in the world with polar bears because of the climate issues that we're all experiencing. And that's uh, kind of kept me busy with the whole idea of the project. Okay. Well, before we talk about that, uh, you alluded to some of the things about uh, Churchill that are uh, 
unique uh, its southern location and is relatively accessible compared to the rest of the Arctic. Right. But um, what's uh, unique about the polar bears there? Are they there year-round or...? Well, they, they pretty much are, yes. Um, you can actually go up there and you won't you won't see them as easily in the summer because they're pretty much trying to, you know, conserve energy in a way to not overheat. Uh, even they're, 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 they're generally laying around in places that you can't see them. Often they'll lay in dens that they've dug under, under the tundra uh, to keep cool along lake shores of some of the little small lakes and that sort of thing. But once in a while you will see them. Um, and as the summer goes on and the and the fall comes around you start to see them get more active and 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 they're you know they're basically what happens is the ice melts out from underneath them in the summertime typically around the second week in July and now that can vary every year but it, it's getting earlier typically it's I think this last year it was uh maybe the first week of July I haven't really um I didn't really look at that, but I know the year before it was around there. So the, the fluctuation can be a couple of weeks here or there, um, both on the front end where they get have to come off the ice and on the back end where they want to get back out on the ice can fluctuate. We can talk about that in a little bit. but And that's really where the problems lie for, in particular, this, this group of polar bears, because they they when they come off the ice in July, they basically have nothing to eat for uh, the entire summer and into the early, early fall until the ice freezes back up. Now, if they're lucky, they might run into a dead beluga whale. Uh, there are some bears up there in the Churchill region that have learned how to catch beluga whales. So that's a unique thing that um, doesn't happen very often, but if they can get a whale, they can, that can really help them get through the summer period where they're not making, having a lot of chances to get out and get food. They'll eat berries, they'll eat bird's eggs, but they're such huge animals. There's been talk about, well, maybe polar bears will, will just transition into eating things on land. And there's a number of problems with that. One is they're huge and they'd have to have so much food from those sources, like say berries and bird's eggs, that it just never would sustain them. And then secondly, they're going to be competing with the, with the uh, barren ground grizzlies that, you know, are, in their territory if they all of a sudden these these polar bears come up on land so there's some number of issues that keep that from being realistic but um but yes you can see them in the summer it's not a great time to see them but it's doable uh and because what happens is they get off the ice and they're going to get off the ice wherever the ice kind of blows so you know some years uh, the ice might blow, let's say there's southern, southerly winds that blow the ice north of Churchill. A long story short, they'll, they'll, they'll get off the ice wherever it melts out from underneath them. So if the ice happens to melt and the wind blows it in towards Churchill during that time of this year, there'll be more bears in Churchill during that summer um, and in the fall. But they do have a tendency to congregate south of Churchill at a place called Cape Churchill, which is in, is in um, Wapus National Park. And the reason for it is because there's, there's lots of fresh water that comes out of, out of the, the inland uh, rivers north of Churchill and north of Cape Churchill uh, that bring lots of fresh water into the bay. So there's a point of land, Cape Churchill comes out into the bay and that point of land has a tendency to act kind of like a pocket so that fresh water gets piled up against that, that barrier. And fresh water, as most of everybody knows that enjoys the outdoors and kind of keeps track of this kind of stuff, is fresh water freezes sooner than salt water. And so with all that fresh water down there um, along the shore during the winter, as, as winter approaches, fall comes on, that starts to freeze sooner and the bears know that they can get out on that ice quicker than they will at say south of there you know down uh, on the southern end of Hudson Bay or anywhere else on the on the bay where it's all all solid salt water so it gets them out on the ice 
And they've been, you know, without food for at least four months, July, August, September, October, going into if, if the ice freezes when it should, it should freeze about November, the second week in November. So we're talking, you know, four and a half months of not eating or eating very, very little. So they're really excited to get out onto that ice and start hunting seals as fast as they possibly can. So yeah, that's what's unique about Churchill. Um, it's, it's, it's the Cape Churchill Peninsula that really is the magnet that draws these bears in to uh, hang out in that area. And as they congregate, you get the chance to see them. And, you know, it's a, it's a concentration of bears that you normally wouldn't see. Right. And uh, so most of the photography in that area is done in tundra buggies, I guess. Uh, Talk about uh, the best way to photograph from tundra buggies. Well, you're right. The The vast majority of, of the um, best opportunities come from being out there in, in an area that is called the uh, Western Hudson Bay uh, Conservation Area, I believe it is. And it's it's restricted, so you have to have permits to get in there. Um, and so the, the buggy the buggy companies have those permits and then, you know, get you into these places. And, you know, the buggies are, are uh, a unique tool that not everybody is, you know, in love with there. They do provide, they do create kind of an issue where you're shooting down on your subjects um, because you're up so high. They, they make them that high for a reason so that the bears, you know, can't, they will come up to the sides of the buggies and stand up next to the buggy. And you don't want anybody having the, 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 the problem of having an arm hanging over or jacket hanging over because they're tall enough to get up above that, you know, above the bottom of that buggy polar bears, a big male can stand as high as 12 feet tall. Mm. Um, and so the windows are about close to 15 feet off the ground. So, when you're shooting from a tundra buggy, one of the best things that you can do is, is be using a fairly long lens. The longer the lens, the more you can, you know, bring your subject in at a distance where it cuts that angle down. So, um, so I really, you know, I, I help people try to understand that if you're going to go up there and shoot, it's important to have at least a 300 and that's, that's minimum. A, a, a 600 millimeter is really helpful because it, it, it allows you to bring the subject in closer and really cut that angle down. So that's one of the kind of tips. Um, the other idea that is very helpful that people uh, uh, have a hard time thinking about is using bean bags on the tundra buggies as opposed to a tripod. I'm not even sure if Tundra Buggies Adventures uh, allows tripods anymore. Um, they're very cumbersome. People trip over them. But more importantly, they're very difficult to maneuver with. If you've got to move, let's say, from front of the buggy to the back of the buggy quickly, they're just they're really difficult to, to navigate with. And so a good beanbag on the side of the window is an absolute must and uh, really helpful for, for getting your uh, being able to stay mobile with being able to go front of the buggy to the back of the buggy or whatever. And, um, and that's kind of nice uh, times. There's times that you might be at one about be out on the back deck and uh, shooting from the back deck, or, you know, there might be there, the, most people shoot from inside on the windows, but either way you can put the bean bag on the back deck or you can put it on the window and it, it works really, really well. So do you shoot right off the beanbag or do you have a gimbal attached or how, how does that work? I would always shoot right off the beanbag. There, there are a few of those beanbags I think that you're alluding to um, that have like a, you can, you can get them with a, a screw in the bottom that you could put a ball head on them, that sort of thing. And that's not a bad idea, but um, I've always been kind of a minimalist. I try to keep my gear uh, you know, to a, a, a small, as small as I possibly can. So I've always just felt the beanbag is just a great, is a great, you know, if, if you get a good one, you got to get a good one, which means typically bigger rather than smaller. Um, I, I've seen the ones that are kind of shaped, like I think they call them the tooth beanbags or something like that. It's got some sort of connection to tooth because they look like kind of a tooth where they hang over the, uh, over the sides. The ones that I typically use, I've, I've used for years is Kinesis. 
And that's a pretty good size bean bag. The other thing that's really important when you're when you go up there and you're going to work with a bean bag is do everybody a favor in particular the bears and don't bring i know it's it's uh tempting there's a type of material that goes in them that's a synthetic plastic that's really super light so if you're traveling with it um it's hard it's it's uh, tempting to buy something that light but i have some other suggestions there's um there's there's material that we found on uh amazon that is like a a wheat shaft or, or it's natural, it's all natural and it's very, very light and it works really good um, to give you a similar feel to beans or rice in a, in a bean bag. And you can buy that for very inexpensively on Amazon. And if the bean bag ever goes out the window and it's happened before and a bear gets a hold of it, the first thing they'll do is carry it off and rip it open and see what's going on in there. And if it's, if it's beans or rice, they're not, it's not a big deal, but if it's those plastic um, that plastic material, it, it really creates a problem for the bears and the, and the habitat that they live in and, you know, all that stuff. We, none of us, we are all starting to come to realize how, what a pain plastic is. So, so yeah, that's what I really suggest is that you, you buy something that's natural that, that isn't going to, uh, affect the bears. You can, when you get up there, you can buy beans and rice at the, like the little general store. Although that's a little risky because if you get there during halfway through the season, you might end up finding that there isn't any available. So I take up this, uh, this material that uh, is natural, that, that is very light. Okay. Are there other ways to photograph polar bears for the average person or? Yep, there is, there really is. There's um, uh when you go to Churchill um, in particular, and Churchill is the, the best place to see the most uh, in a shortest period of time. And if you don't go out on a tundra buggy, there is always the option to rent a vehicle and drive the little roads around town. Now, you're not going to be guaranteed as obviously as, as, as much as you would be if you were out on a tundra buggy, but it's a lot less expensive. Obviously the buggies are expensive. There's no doubt about it. Um, and you, there's a number of little roads that, you know, go down by the coast and, um, and around town that can give you the opportunity to, uh, you know, run into a polar bear and, and ideally you want to be in your vehicle. You don't want to be out with these guys on, on the, on the, on the tundra, or even on the edge of the road, you want to shoot from your car. If you do see them from your vehicle and uh, give them plenty of uh, space, again, long telephoto lenses are the, are the key to keeping the bear safe, which is the most important aspect of natural history photography. In my opinion, is that it's one of the beauties of uh, people not paying for pictures anymore. It keeps photographers a lot of, well, it, it helps eliminate people from doing things they probably shouldn't be doing uh, to just get pictures. And so, uh, you know, keeping the bear's interest in best interest in mind is, is the most important thing that we can do as natural history photographers. So uh, yeah, working from a, uh, you know, a four wheel drive truck, you did, did, they actually, I don't think they rent anything but four wheel drive up there because it, these are little, little uh, you know, offshoots of the main roads that can get drifted with snow and you have to be careful, but um there are opportunities to see the bears in the rocks and down along the shore and that sort of thing. Okay. Can you uh, hire a guide to take you out or? There are, you know, there's a couple of guys up there. I've never looked into it. Um, there's one that I know of that uh, I think Dennis is still doing this, His but his last name is Comperier. Uh, it's hard to spell. Um, okay. I'll bet this will do it. Here we go. Um, yeah, so it's Dennis Comperier, C O M P A Y R E. And uh, Dennis, you can actually, he'll, he'll, um, you could look him up on Facebook. I know he's on Facebook. And uh, I think he lives in Winnipeg now during the off season. But, but that's, that's, that's the guy that I would, I would be most inclined to suggest people look into. And, and that's a good idea because he really does have a, a feel for where the bears are um, uh, if you don't have a tundra buggy to get out into. And I think he has a four-wheel drive vehicle that he takes people out with. 
The other, there's another place that's kind of interesting. Uh, Churchill Wild is north of, Chur- of of the town of Churchill, and it's a lodge. And they have bear opportunities. It, most of them, as I understand it, I've never been out there during their polar bear times, but they have a f- they have a fence around the lodge, and they're right on the coast. And the bears come through there, and give you an opportunity to uh, photograph them as they're coming through. Um, so that's another that's another option. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. So, uh, what sort of uh, price range for doing all these things? Well, uh, boy, they've gone up. You know, I don't know what Dennis is. Is let's let's you know when I say they've gone up. I I, I was going back in the eighties and the nineties, and you know, a, a seven week or a seven day trip was in the thirty five hundred dollar range. But my goodness, I think now it's you know in the ten to twelve thousand dollar range, something like that for Cape Churchill. Um, but it would be obviously much less expensive. I think Churchill Wild is pretty close to similar costs. It might be a little bit less expensive. I don't know. Um, I've been fortunate in my work now with Polar Bears International. I go up there to help PBI and, and I get involved with uh, uh, their work. And so I'm, I'm not really having to you know, look at this as a normal, you know, the normal tourist and, and travel photographer might do if they want to go up there and take pictures. But, um, but the least expensive would be your, your opportunities to go up and, you know, rent a vehicle and, and see if you can't put her around. And, you know, uh, the hotels are not cheap, but um, there's a couple in town that are, you know, a little less fancy than others. And so you can save a little money there. And if you're really, um, if you're really excited to do it on the, on the down low, you can, I suppose you could camp in the back of your truck if you needed to, it could be cold, but I've done it before, not up there, but I've done it. Yeah. I gotta believe it's, uh, gets my chili there. If, uh, if the polar bears are there, it can be, it can be right now this week, it's pretty warm, but it, we're hoping we're going to start to see the temperatures drop here in the next week or so. So can you actually drive to Churchill or you have to fly in or take a train? Yeah, you got to either fly in or take a train. Um, uh, yeah, there's there's no road system at this point. There's always been kind of talk over the years about putting a road into Churchill, but it's never happened. Yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a remote place to get to. It's a difficult place to get to, but it's part of the reason um, it's still so special. Yeah. Okay. Well, you mentioned Polar Bear International. Uh, talk about your work with them. Yeah. PBI is an organization that I got involved with back in the, actually really kind of started working with uh, the original founder, this gentleman named Dan Gurevich. Dan uh, started this group. Originally, the, he called them Polar Bears Alive. He was a photographer and he, he had gone up to Churchill, started this nonprofit after falling in love with polar bears and uh, started this group called Polar Bears Alive, they evolved. Dan passed away in the mid nineties and, and PBI or uh, Polar Bears Alive was looking for somebody to help them continue with the organization. The idea was to help people understand more about polar bears. Um, Dan Gurevich kind of talked, he called it Polar Bears Alive as opposed to, he didn't like the fact that the native people wanted to hunt them and that the scientists wanted to study them. And he really thought polar bears should just be photographed, which <laughs> you can't blame him. Um, uh, uh, but as, as when he passed away, the organization actually had built up a pretty interesting little nonprofit. And, <clears throat> and they hired a good friend of mine, Robert Buchanan, to take the group over and Robert and Carolyn loved polar bears. I met him up there as a photographer, but he was really a successful business person that, that loved photography. And so he took the organization over and turned and changed the name to polar bears international. And that was in the mid nineties thereabouts. And um, Robert and I were good friends and um, I convinced him, uh, he and his wife had, they, they had sold their home and were basically just traveling around in their motor home. But the organization was actually turning into quite a, 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 a very special and successful nonprofit group uh, now dealing with polar bear scientists and tourism, com- you know, tourist, uh, tourist companies and, 
and research and all that sort of thing. So uh, it got to a point where they needed a home and I convinced Robert to settle down here in my hometown of Bozeman, Montana. Bozeman has a lot of nonprofits. So uh, there's good people here who love nature and are willing to work for the, for the types of, of income that nonprofits are known for. There's a lot of passion in the nonprofit world here. A good friend of mine, Krista Wright, who is now the executive director and CEO of Polar Bears International, she um, started out as Robert's right-hand gal. And uh, eventually when we we're having dinner with our, my wife and her husband and other family members around here, she often reminds me that I'm the one that got her into this mess. <laughs> <laughs> And, and she says it with love though, because I've never seen, I've never seen somebody, somebody work so hard for something that is not their own business. Um, I've just, she just puts immense amounts of hours into it. And, uh, and so now we, we, when, when PBI settled down here in Bozeman, um, uh, Krista took over and we just decided at the time, my wife, Tanya and I were helping uh, PBI with marketing and emailing and helping them with pictures to help promote, you know, their cause of, of research with polar bears and, and information about polar bears. And so we, we rented an office together and we still share that office today. We now, we, we, I share an office with polar bears international. So we're pretty well tied together. Uh, and it's been a great, um, very rewarding, uh, uh, personally rewarding, not necessarily financially. All my work is done on a, on a, a pro bono basis with PBI. And uh, we, but it's been a very, you know, special relationship that I could have never dreamed to have of organized. You know, I, I, when I was selling, when I was working as a photographer and marketing my work um, with, with, uh, not other nonprofits, you were just one of many, many photographers. And with PBI, um, we don't get paid, but we're pretty much on the top of their list when something as special is happening. They need pictures of it. And I'm, I'm able to, if I'm, if I'm available, I'm able to go and, and document it uh, under the umbrella of the Arctic Documentary Project, which is kind of a, it's, it's an, it's a, it's under the umbrella of PBI and it's a non, it's, it's PBI's own uh, nonprofit that is, tied into documenting the research and science and the changes going on in the Arctic that uh, we're seeing over the last 20, 30 years and, and are continuing to do that work in the, in now and into the future. These are, these are two big males. Um, there's, this is out at Cape Churchill, which they, they, they unfortunately, uh, it's gotten so warm that they can't, the tundra buggies can't get out to Cape Churchill anymore. This is at Wapoose National Park. And this is back in the early 2000s, I guess. Um, large males are known to kind of do what they call play fight or wrestle or spar. There's a couple of different names for it. The scientists aren't totally, you know, sure of what they're doing, but there's the general kind of consensus is that this is a way for them to um, wrestle with each other and get to know each other so that when they get out on the ice, they remember who who they were wrestling with and who was the biggest and the strongest. They typically don't fight that hard uh, over females because they generally get this stuff worked out. They feel the scientists feel they get this worked out in the early fall season where they do a lot of, of, of this um, just mouthing with each other, pushing each other, wrestling with each other, shoving each other. It's really, it's really quite fun to watch. Um, yep. That's two of them. Um, you know, just kind of, john with each other <laughs> they look pretty serious they do i know boy the teeth are the the teeth are really show you that they they've got some serious weapons if they when if and when they want to use them All right but but you'll notice when they are wrestling like that they'll um they'll have little blood uh stains on their neck because they chew on each other's neck and it's that <laughs> you know it doesn't come out gushing by any stretch but it shows you that they're they're playing but for us that we'd be in serious trouble yeah that's a that's another remote camera image that i shot um uh very close to this mama that's her cub off in the distance uh to the right but um yeah just a a, a close-up that that 
you know, the lot of things with these close-ups, I you don't get a chance to really frame them like you'd like, and sometimes that's it's it's really neat that way. It's uh, I like the fact that I can't see anything but their her legs and her, her neck, and then off in the distance, we see her cub that tells us what you know exactly what she is that we're what we're looking at. Yeah, it's uh, it's a nice composition, I'd have to say. Well, thank you. Yeah, it's a little bit of luck there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, this is a this is kind of a unique picture as well. Um, this is this is Dr. Steve Anstrup. Dr. Anstrup was the scientist who he'd been he studied polar bears on the Beaufort Sea in Alaska for 30 years. And back during the Bush administration, his science was used to list polar bears as the first species to ever be uh, added to the endangered species list as a threatened species. Um, based on what they predict is going to happen to polar bears, as opposed to what the situation was at the time. And um, that's a very, very unique honor and uh, kind of a sad one. But thankfully, from all the science that he did, they were able to convince the federal government that we really have to take what's happening in the Arctic seriously, or we're going to, we could very well lose these animals. So are we taking it seriously yet? Well, we'll find out in a couple of weeks whether we can get, you know, some of this stuff through that's going to help us with, you know, reducing our, all of our, our carbon footprint and hopefully reducing CO2 emissions that affect polar bears so drastically. But so let's talk a little bit about the picture. Um, this is a helicopter. Uh, the, the, I'm looking back on Dr. Anstrup. I was up there the year before doing the same shoot with him where I was documenting him working in the field. And I'm sitting uh, to his left in the back of that helicopter as I watch him from behind looking down and not being able to see the bear or anything and thinking, oh my gosh, everything that's cool that's going on is outside. How am I going to get a picture of that? And so the next year, I decided I was going to see if the guys would let me attach a remote camera to the side of this helicopter. And so um, we did, there was a, there was a, a, a bar that comes off the helicopter that, that um, had a mirror on it. And I brought a, a, a Bogan super clamp and a, a, a long remote cord and, um, and a little protective device for the camera and a really wide angle lens. I think I shot this with a 20 millimeter lens. And um, we shot that week, we shot probably, I don't know, a thousand images like this. And what would happen is he would, the, the pilot would come over the polar bear, Dr. Anstrup would lean out the window and I would just smash on the button of the, of the remote con cord that I had, not having any idea what I was getting. And out of a thousand pictures, this is literally the first frame of the first time we tried it. And I got nothing even close to this good the entire rest of the time we were working. So once again, you know, good old fashioned luck stepped in and we got a kind of a neat image that's, that's pretty unique um, showing, you know, what it's like being, you know, hanging outside the, the helicopter trying to dart one of these bears that then, then he, then the helicopter would land and uh, they'd go ahead and do their, their uh, collection uh, process of, you know, blood and, and weight and all that sort of thing. Yeah, that was. So was uh, this done with film or digital? This was done with digital, right? In early, early days of digital. I think this was a, I want to say this was a Nikon D100 camera possibly. It might have been, it might have been a D2 or, D2, or, D, or the D2H. It was one of those. It was very, very, very much at the uh, very beginning of digital. Oh. Yeah. And there wasn't any possibility of uh, remote monitoring or anything in those days, no. I'm sure. No, there wasn't. You know, we could do this today a lot easier, but I'll tell you, I've actually thought about this many times. And, you know, the more, the more stuff you, you hook up to that sort of thing, the more things that can go wrong. And uh, it was really kind of, I had a, I actually had a friend help me make this, you know, 15 foot remote cord that, you know, snaked in from the camera to the door of the helicopter and then back to the back seat. And that was really pretty much as, it was, it was pretty much a manual affair almost, 
which is really good if you can keep it down to a minimum because the more, you know, I've actually thought about, okay, now the cameras, we have cameras that have, you know, wireless, um, you know, you can connect up into wirelessly, but boy, I've been in situations where I'm on the ground 15 feet away and I can't get those things to work, <laughs> let alone being in a helicopter flying along at, you know, 80 miles an hour. Sure. So this is Dr. Anstrup um, getting out of the helicopter. And what's kind of unique about this picture is that he actually was able to dart two bears at one time. This is a big male that was, was after a female and he was, they have enough, he was able to set this up so he could dart the male and still have enough time to do the female. And so, um, yeah, so it was kind of a unique opportunity to uh, be off with the male and get some pictures of, of, you know, what's, what's going on in the background. And that's out, that's out probably about 50 miles out onto the Beaufort sea in the spring around April. I don't know. I'm guessing it was probably around April 25th or something like that. And that's Dr. Anstrup on his way out. This is just a couple of years before he retired. And now I should mention uh, Steve, who he, his, his uh, first name is Steve. Dr. Steve Anstrup is now works as the senior scientist for Polar Bears International. Before we go, talk about where people can find you and all the work you do. Sure. Yeah. Well, we've been, we've had a website since 1996 and, uh, call it naturalexposures.com. Our little company is called Natural Exposures. I, 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 I named it that originally because uh, I feel very strongly I had good people around me all my life helping me with being successful. And um, it's not just about me. It's about our little group of, of, uh, of team members that we, we get this material out to people and work with people helping educate folks about nature and wildlife. So it's naturalexposures.com is our website. We're on Instagram at natural exposure, or I'm sorry, Daniel J. Cox, N-E, which is uh, abbreviation for natural exposure. So that's at natural or uh, Daniel J. J. Cox, N-E. We've got a YouTube channel, um, Daniel J. Cox, natural exposures. And uh, yeah, Facebook, um, natural exposures, Daniel J. Cox. So we've, we've got pretty much all the bases covered. We haven't done anything on TikTok yet. I'm not sure I want to go that route. Me either. <laughs> <laughs> but good grief. You know, I look at uh, my wife and I, one of the things that we do is kind of our, our, our real job now is that we teach photography and we take people to places all over the world that I used to go to take pictures just during my living. And, um, um, you know, our clientele are, are older people. Uh, and I've really tried to figure out how do you get younger people interested in this stuff? It's, it's um, it seems to be a challenge, and that's I, I literally signed up for TikTok the other day. I have not been able to bring myself to look at it yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, because you know the things that we hear about are the you know the crazy things, but I I'm trying to keep an open mind and I'm looking into it, and I, who knows what'll happen. But let's put it this way: you'll never see me doing any dances on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> me either. <laughs> okay, good. So yeah, those are our social media channels. Um, other than that, uh, you know, um, I do some work with outdoor photographer once in a while and, uh, yeah, I'm just, you know, trying to keep my fingers in the, in the, in the business and all different aspects of the pie. And yeah, we're, uh, you know, I'm happy to answer questions on Facebook. We do, we do a lot more publishing on Facebook than I used to. Uh, I kind of had to get used to the idea that, you know, that's the way Facebook works. Nobody's paying me for releasing my pictures, but you know, it's kind of fun. Um, and so we, we get questions and it, and I actually enjoy that part of it. Uh, you know, s pictures look a certain way and, and uh, feel free to ping me and I'm open to discussing all that with people. Great. 